Hey everybody, this is Shelly Kramer. Welcome to this week's episode of Future of Work Talk. Today, I'm really excited actually about my guest today because there's so much going on in our country, in our world. I think that we're probably more divided and more polarized than we have been in a very long time, at least longer than I can remember. And so, but not only is our political landscape divided and polarized, our workplace landscape is as well. And so that's why I'm really excited about my guest today, um, Howard Ross. And Howard is an author and he's a social justice expert and he's written a couple books. We're going to, he's actually written three books. We're going to talk about one of them specifically today, but Howard, welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks so much, Shelley. It's great to be with you, and Happy New Year. Same to you. Same to you. You know, today's January 10th. Before mm-hmm. we know it, it'll be, you know, Christmas again. It goes so quickly. It's crazy. <laughs> it seems to, yeah. It's crazy. I think that's a fun, uh, a benefit of getting older. Time goes so much, so quickly. So, Howard, tell us a little bit about you and your background so that, so that we can get acquainted. Sure. Thanks, Shelley. Um, yeah, I, as you mentioned, you know, I've been a social justice advocate my whole life. I got involved in doing work in civil rights and uh, when I was a youngster and um, working with the, on the anti-war movement and with the um, you know, farm workers boycott and the like. And um, that led me to really an appreciation of diversity. And at the same time, professionally, I was trained as an organizational development um, uh, proponent. And so uh, doing work with organizations around culture change. And the two came together in the mid to late 80s when we had large numbers of women and people of color coming into organizations because of court orders and creating environments which people didn't really know how to work together. Um, and so I started doing consulting and have now for about 35 years done consulting with organizations all over the world, uh, helping them look at how do we create more inclusive cultures. Uh, mm-hmm. That led to the, my first book, Reinventing Diversity, um, which came out in 2011, which just generally talked about how do we create cultures of inclusion. Um, But then it became apparent to me that one of the real barriers that we had for getting where we wanted to go um, was unconscious bias and the way we unconsciously make decisions, which led to the second book, Everyday Bias, which came out in 2014, actually right around the time that Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson. And, um, and, um, And the third book, the one we want to talk about today, Our Search for Belonging, really evolved out of my own looking at my reactions to what was happening in our culture. You know, I, I grew up in an environment in which we were really encouraged uh, by our parents to understand other people's points of view, even as we had strong points of view ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean not taking a strong point of view. I mean, being able to have a point of view, but realizing it's a point of view and recognizing trying to understand the legitimacy of the other side as well. And I found myself becoming more and more, uh, being more and more difficult for me to do that. And so it just raised my curiosity as to what is it about us as human beings that forms these tribes that we get into and warps our thinking so much so that we can only see ourselves as right and the other is wrong, and hence our search for belonging. Right. Well, fascinating, fascinating. Um, So in our conversations, you shared the that an apt descriptor of one of the things that you're talking about in your book is the whole foods and the cracker barrel part of the equation and 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 how those those brands are a perfect example of the kind of polarization that you're talking about tell me about that yeah, sure. This is actually something that uh, was a study that was first done by the Cook Political Report back in 1992. Um, and just to preface it by saying most of us realize that the thing that you said in the introduction, that we are feeling more polarized than most of us can ever remember. I mean, for the most part, we've lived in a bell curve society right. where you had people's on the people on the extremes, but people, most people were willing to negotiate with or collaborate with people on the other side on an issue by issue basis. So right. I might disagree with you about civil rights, but agree with you about gun rights, Rights. for example. Now we've turned into this dumbbell curve society where everything's on the end and nothing in the middle. And the the study you're referring to is really um, points to this. Uh, Not surprisingly, for those people who know Whole Foods markets, they generally tend to be in liberal communities. Um, Cracker Barrel family restaurants tend to be in more conservative communities. And so what, what the Cook Political Report started to do back in 92 was to see how people voted in those communities relative to the other side. And so when they first did it in 1992, when it was the Clinton Bush election, um, what they found was there was about a 20% difference. Um, In other words, about 20% more people in the liberal communities voted Democratic and 20% more people in the conservative communities voted Republican. 
They've tracked that every year, and every year it's gone higher to the point where in the last election, in the 2016 election, the gap is now 54 percent. So what that means is that we're not only having strong political points of view, but we're increasingly segregating based on where we're living, which means that not only do you have your friends on Facebook and the like who agree with you, but it means that your neighbors tend to agree with you. The people you go to church with or synagogue or mosque tend to agree with you. The people who you get haircuts with agree with you. The people who you go to grocery stores agree with you. The people who your children go to school to. And, and what it speaks to, I think, which is so important right now is to understand the bubbles that we're living in, that we're living in these contain bubbles and echo chambers where we simply are around people who agree with us all the time. And that contributes to the calcification of our ideas. Yeah. And I think too, um, I, I think it also tends to, I, I think about, um, my own community and interactions and conversations with people. And I think it also tends to make us personally, maybe draw into ourselves a little bit more, because you, um, when you're operating, because I, I, my community is, you know, I live in the middle of Missouri. It's a red state. I live in a city that's, you know, fairly liberal city as cities tend to be, but still mm-hmm. plenty of, plenty of conservatives and conservative liberals and conservative <laughs> Republicans <laughs> and Democrats, you know, right. <clears throat> but, but it is interesting because it's almost like like you say, you know, we used to occasionally be able to have conversations with, um, I'm a Democrat, my husband's a Republican. And we Mm -hmm. used to joke about the fact that we existed simply to cancel one another's votes out (laughs) at the poll. (laughs) And he totally understood the issues that were important to me and why I voted the way I voted. And I understood the issues that were important to him and why he voted the way he voted. And we didn't always agree, obviously, on on candidates and outcomes of elections and all that sort of thing, but it was fine. And so what has happened, though, is that nothing's fine anymore. It's like, I hate you and you hate me. And it's it's terrible. And so I do see when that when that translates into the workplace. Well, you know, I think it's, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I was going to say, first of all, I'd say at least you're not as bad as uh, Kellyanne and George Conway. Let's say, you know, (laughs) that um, that is um, bizarre. (laughs) It is pretty strange, isn't it? Um, But I I do think that there's, what you're pointing to really ties into what I was talking about earlier about this, this, uh, these echo chambers that are forming. Because if you think about it, you know, we we go onto Facebook, those of us who are participating in social media, and uh, people more and more increasingly unfriend people who don't agree with them. You go onto Twitter and you block people who don't agree with you. And and you get this sense that the entire world agrees with you. And one of the things I did for the book, because I do tend to come from the liberal side, was I went out and interviewed over 100 people who voted for President Trump because I really wanted to understand. And, And I have to say, it devastated my stereotypes. Um, you know, I had this sense based on watching TV and the things I was seeing and, and the like. And I also watch multiple media sources. I, I have my news feed come from different media sources on purpose, even though sometimes I feel like throwing something at the TV. It's right. important to hear the other point of view, you know. I did that um, as well. And Exactly right. And and what I found in talking to people was that there are reasonable people, caring people, really good, decent people um, who – just see the world very differently. And that doesn't mean that I think they're right, but but there's a big difference between seeing somebody as wrong in their point of view versus seeing somebody as wrong as a person. And I think this is the challenge. We've gone from being an issue-oriented society in terms of these things to an identity-oriented society. It's no longer I disagree with you about gun rights. It's now you're one of those kind of people. Right. And at that point, it's very hard to find any negotiating space. And of course, we see that being played out this week with our government. Exactly. So tell me, um, you know, I mean, this may sort of be an obvious question, but tell me how society is kind of program programming us down this path of, of the us and the them. Well, I think, first of all, uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, as citizens of a democratic society, we have to take full responsibility for what we've got in front of us right now, sure. because we've chosen we've chosen this. Whether we chose it consciously, whether we got unintended consequences or not, we've chosen it. And I think that each of us as citizens has a responsibility to get ourselves unstuck. Um, but I think when you, when you look at particularly media and the differences in media now compared to what they were, for example, when I was growing up, I actually, today's my birthday, I'm 68 years old. And, Happy and birthday. So, 
Thank you. So I grew up in a very different era. And we used to watch ABC, NBC and CBS. And it was basically homogenized news. You know, it was all the same news. It was also this was before the ethics, um, uh, journalistic ethics uh, standards were changed. And the FCC changed the, the equal balance standards. Um, th- it was considered to be unethical for a, for a journalist to take a point of view on yes. air. I mean, if you remember when when Walter Cronkite came out against the Vietnam War, it was seismic. In fact, Lyndon Johnson later said that when we lost Walter Cronkite, we lost the country. Uh, Nowadays, of course, we watch very different news. If you watch Fox and I watch MSNBC or if you read um, the Huff Post and I read Breitbart or – you know, right. down we could go down the line. Absolutely. We're getting not just completely different interpretations of the news, we're getting actual completely different news. And this becomes really dangerous because at some point you wonder if the sky is the same color in the other right. person's world. Right. Well, and what's true and what's not true and your truth is different than my truth. And it, it, it is very, it, it, it's very challenging. And I do the same thing that you do. I really work hard to get, I'm a voracious cons- consumer of news and information, and I, I constantly checking, you know, different sources or having conversations with people and trying to kind of get a different, um, a different point of view. And I'm also really, really careful about. I, I have a big social media presence, I'm really careful about what information I share. And I have educated myself about, you know, this is a far left publication and this is a far right publication. And I, I, you know, I, I, and I try to, um, I, I try to share things that have been vetted and that aren't too crazy out there. So, so, but, but not everybody, not everybody has those not everybody has those that level of awareness. And I, I'm not trying to say I'm something special or anything else, right. but but <clears throat> I think that sometimes we see something. Many people see something and it's true. And I have some very very intelligent, very successful friends, and sometimes I see some of the stuff that they're sharing, and I'm like, you know, and I, I'll be the first person to <laughs> pop in and go, you know, fact check this or whatever. But yeah. but I think yeah, I get a trouble. I, I, I'm sorry. I was going to yeah. say I know that I know that I'm heading in the right direction when I get in trouble with both my liberal and conservative friends sometimes right. for calling them on things. I I think that you know at the heart of what you're saying though is one of the things that that it's so important for people to understand, which is that we think that we're rational as human beings, but actually we're not. Actually, we're driven mostly by our emotions, right. uh, and we're far more rationalizing than we are rational. So if we put that in the context of seeking information, like like you're talking about, we think that we seek information like scientists. In other words, we go around and kind of explore to find out what's going on. <laughs> but the truth is we seek information much more like attorneys looking for evidence to support our already established point of view. And therefore, you know, it's much easier for us to, if you're on the left, much easier to believe something that feels a little strange if it comes from Rachel Maddow, but and, and automatically to disregard something that doesn't agree with you if it comes from Sean Hannity and vice okay. versa if you're on the right, okay. rather than to really explore and to understand that both in each in their own way and obviously from different political points of view are trying to make a point and therefore cherry picking information that tries to make that point. Right. Um, and so I, I, I believe I have very strong points of view and I have no problem sharing those points of view. And I have, you know, strong evaluations and, and you know, judgments about certain politicians and the like. That doesn't mean that I don't also honor the fact that there are good human beings on the other side who disagree with me. And I think sometimes people mistake the fact that they think that being civil means that you have to that you can't have a strong point of view. Um, where for me, I think the two can coexist. Yeah, I agree. So, so we've talked about the state of the world, and we've touched on politics. How does all this impact organizational culture? How, um, what are we seeing in the workplace as it relates to this polarization? Well, first of all, I think that that we have to recognize um, that uh, the power of belonging and and how important it is to us. You know, most everybody I'm sure who's listening is sort of Maslow's hierarchy. Abraham Maslow in 1943 created his now very famous model, which is usually depicted in a pyramid. Um, And he basically said there's certain needs you have to get met before other needs. So you get physiological needs and then safety and then belonging and then self-esteem and then finally self-actualization or self-awareness. What we're finding now through the neuro and cognitive of science research is that Maslow was actually wrong, that belonging is our fundamental human need. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, what's the most 
what's the most vulnerable time of a human being's existence? You know, a newborn baby. Right. And if a newborn baby doesn't belong to someone, they die, very simply. Right. And so the first imprint that we get as human beings for the first several years of our lives is I exist because you exist. And this is one of the reasons why everybody who's listening to us can think of a time when they went along with something they didn't agree with just to get approval of a group, or they didn't challenge an idea because they didn't want to be shunned by a group. We have a the tremendous need to belong. And so when we look at the workplace environment, a lot of people ask me sometimes in the context of diversity work, you know, well, how do, where does this term fit in? And my, my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Jeanetta Cole, um, has said that, uh, that diversity is being invited to the dance and inclusion is actually being allowed to dance. I would say belonging is when you actually get to choose some of the music. Yeah. Um, that, that, that environments of belonging where people really feel like they're included um, are, are environments in which people feel like what they have to say, their perspective is valued. It's important. It's important at all levels of the organization. It's not just about having numbers there, but it's about having a voice and being listened to. It's about um, being considered from different perspectives so that, for example, as a man dealing with what's going on now with the Me Too movement, and um, you know, which has been just this remarkable, courageous you know, outpouring of people, but also can go to extremes sometimes, like anything else in life. Um, for me to understand and that it's, it's so important for me to listen to what women have to say about that before making determinations about how it's affecting me. It doesn't mean that, I don't have a, that I'm not entitled to a point of view, but my point of view has to be somewhat informed by people who are being affected by it in a different way. And the, mm -hmm. the same is true around race. As, as a, a person of color, people have to understand how it impacts people of different racial groups, or as a white person, how it affects people of color. For those of us who are heterosexual, to understand how dynamics in the workplace impact LGBT people in ways that we may not even realize because right. not because we don't care, but because people have a tendency to see things from their own point of view. You know, the great example that I give uh, for this in our society today is the, the three words, uh, Black Lives Matter, which are three of the most controversial words in America today. And we know that we have these two very strong points of view in our society about these three words. But what people aren't paying attention to is that when we see those three words, we're actually not reacting to three words. We're reacting to four words. But the fourth word is invisible, and it's different for each group. You see, some people, when they see Black Lives Matter, see the words only Black Lives Matter. Some people, when they see those same three words see black lives matter too and which of those perspectives you come from completely shapes how you react to those three words but we rarely discuss that and so the more we get this stuff consciously onto the surface the more we can begin to create environments where we can understand each other enough to try to find ways to beat each other and compromise that makes perfect sense so what um what can businesses and organizations do to create an environment and a culture that's inclusive and and tackle these issues? One thing is to be really clear uh, what direction we're going as an organization, what we're here for, um, and uh, and how the things that we do um, and the choices we make are supported by values that are very clear in the organization. Um, we've moved, uh, sadly, uh, societally into a circumstance where the ends tend to justify the means for most people. Um, and uh, in, in philosophy, they call this a deontological approach, and that is as when you come from your values being important regardless how they play out. So, for example, using a political example, you know, I'm completely on the other side politically from somebody like Ann Coulter. You know, I completely disagree with her, and yet I will stand and fight for her right to speak because I think freedom of speech is important regardless of who's the one who's speaking. You know, um, we're getting to a point now where people say, no, this person can speak, but that person can't speak without even realizing the danger that that is in, in, for our society. I think similarly in the workplace, we can create ways where we say very clear to people, these are the values that govern us. These are the, the ways that we make decisions, and we're going to constantly come back to these tried and true ways of making decisions. You know, if we look at some of the great organizations over time, you know, the Hewlett Packard just popped into my mind. The Hewlett Packard way was the, you know, was was sort of one way of looking at that. These um, organizations that have very clear values orientation tend to be the ones that sustain themselves over time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes some people may not like the choices that are made because of those values. Sometimes those same people may support the choices that are made because of those very same values. Um, but the values are what drive us rather than our visceral reactions. And then the third piece is, of course, is really important, or a third piece, I should say, which is really important. 
is that we create a space of having open, courageous dialogue around these issues in a constructive way. Um, and there's some people around, you know, for example, Caroline Wanga, who's the chief diversity officer at Target, or James Momon, who's a chief diversity officer at General Foods, um, are conducting sessions with their employees where they bring them together and give them a forum to have healthy, constructive conversations about some issue, some difficult issues of the day. Mm-hmm. They don't necessarily resolve or come to agreement, but they learn to respect each other and each other's right to speak. And when we get to that place, then we're not so fearful about these conversations because we understand that we know how to handle them. We know how to have those conversations in, in productive ways. Yeah. And I think sometimes <clears throat> I can give an example. Um, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And mm-hmm. we, as humans, tend to operate within the realm of, I like this, so everybody else must too. Mm-hmm. And, Many people are saying. <laughs> and um, But uh, my example is I, I was in a meeting uh, seven or eight years ago with a client, and there were 12 of us around the table, large mm-hmm. global uh, engineering consulting firm, and we were working on a campaign, and we were talking about how we were going to communicate mm-hmm. with people. And um, somebody wanted to, uh, I, I can't remember, you know, somebody wanted to, um, only communicate by email and somebody else wanted to only communicate by way of social media and somebody else wanted to do only a video. And one of the things that I said is that, you know, we all like different things. And mm-hmm. for instance, I think you're awesome and you have a great radio voice and you are a fan. So you would be a fantastic person person on a podcast, obviously. But, but you know what, if the only thing you do is do a podcast, I'm never going to find you. And I'm never mm-hmm. going to listen to you because I don't listen to podcasts. Right. Right. But if you write and something you write or, and, or you end up in my email box or something like that comes across my field of vision. So my point in that example is we, we like what we like, whether it's email or I want my communication by way of text message or I want to listen to podcasts. And so sometimes it's sitting in the room and hearing somebody else go, Howard, I love you, but I'm never going to listen to your podcast. And here's right. why. And so so the, yeah. that, the, the, a different example, but I think that it applies to the issue of inclusion and having those conversations because it just doesn't even occur to us. Well, Shelley, I think I think what you're speaking to actually speaks directly to the heart of why belonging can be such a powerful, positive influence in organizations. Because if you take what you're talking about relative to various different media and you put that into a conversation about what different customers may need. Right. And if I've got an organization um, that's very diverse and um, and the people who represent the diversity of my community are in my organization and their voices are listened to and I'm paying attention to them and I'm drawing from them information to help me, the product that I produce for my client base is likely (laughs) to be much broader and more diverse and therefore speak to more clients than if a bunch of people up top in the organization, which usually is white male in most cases, if a bunch of white guys are sitting around by themselves trying to figure it out, even with the best of intentions. And I'm not talking about right. overt racism or hatred or right. anything like that. I'm just talking about blind spots that we have because we see the world from different perspectives. Right. And, and so the very thing you're talking about speaks to exactly why it's in the best interest of organizations to, to be more inclusive, to have a greater sense of belonging. And it's not just external, by the way. It's also a function of if I'm creating internal policies in my organization that impact my employees and I have a broader range of employees to get input from in coming up to what those policies will be, it's very likely that it's going to meet the needs of more people than if I sit in some ivory tower office right. with a group of people who look like me and say, let's do this. Right. Uh, because we don't know what we don't know. Well, and we're also dealing with a an incredibly uh, a changing workforce. We've got the millennials who aren't young anymore. We've got Gen Z. Um, we've got people who, you know, you and I are old enough that we came up during a time when you kind of, you know, sold yourself to the company, you know, and there was nothing that, that you wouldn't sacrifice as, at least in my life, right. as I was making my way up the corporate ladder. And, um, you know, today's 
younger generation of workers aren't quite so interested in selling their souls so easily. And so you've got uh, a diverse workforce, a changing workforce. You've got a very tight job market. And so when, if you're focused on talent recruiting, if you're focused on talent retention, your job is harder than ever before. So it, I think it is important to have these conversations and to create a culture that walks the walk and talks the talk when, when it comes to this. And as you said, you know, all of it, I don't care what you sell. I don't care if you sell um, widgets. I don't care if you sell beauty products, it doesn't matter whether you're a B2B company or a B2C company, um, your people buy what it is you sell. <laughs> That's right. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting because I think um, a lot of times um, as human beings, we, we're, it's more important to us to be right than to be successful. And, and I look and I see people points of view these days. And, you know, when I, when I sometimes talk about the work, people come up to me and they say, well, how can you, you know, even waste your time? I can't tell you how many people on, the, on my side of the political thing have said, why did you waste your time talking to all these people who voted the other way? You know, and my response is, first of all, just to understand. But secondly, if I'm going to try to convince people um, to look at the world differently, it starts when I understand how they're now looking at the world. Um, if I don't understand how they're now looking at the world, the chances of my speaking to them in a way that they can listen is is n almost zero. It's a little bit like when you go into the mall and you're looking for the shoe store. What's the first thing you do? You look for that map that says you are here. Okay. Because until until you know where you are on that map, the map is useless to you. Um, and so what I try to get people to see is this is a practical as well as a philosophical point of view to take. I'm not just saying let's all be nice to each other. Yeah. I'm saying let's find a way to understand each other so that we can work and live together because like it or not, we're codependent in this organization called the United States that we live in. Right. Well, and not to mention it would be incredibly difficult to write a book on this topic without stepping outside your own biases. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you have to have those conversations with other I people. Guess. You have to. I mean, I think, I, I don't yeah. know. I, Although you'd be surprised how many people don't. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, Howard, this has really been a fascinating discussion. Thanks so much for taking time to join me today. And for those of you listening, the, Howard's latest book again is Our Search for Belonging, How the Need for Connection is Tearing Our Culture Apart. I will include a link to it um, in the show notes for the show. And um, I, I really do appreciate the time you took today. It's been very, I've learned a lot. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I can't read you. I haven't yet had a chance to read your book, but I will. So. All right, great. All Maybe right. we could talk again after that. That so would be, be great. great. And you All have right. a wonderful birthday. Thanks. Thank for, you so much. Thanks for joining yeah. me. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.